Well, good afternoon, everybody. It's great to see you all here this afternoon for our session on access and affordability, please. Uh, I'd like to request that we all take our seats. My name is Julie Yeshuru. I've come in from East Africa, and it's a great honor to be with you all today. Let me introduce our panel to you, also from my region. Um, on the far end uh, is Judith Okite, who is the IG coordinator from the Free Software and Open Source Foundation for Africa, FOSFA, and she's based in Kenya. Right next to Judith, um, we have Sonia Yo. Jorge? George. George, oh, okay. <laughs> I was trying. Um, but Sonia is um, the executive director of the Alliance for Affordable Internet. Great to see you both with us Thank this you. afternoon. And uh, next to Sonia, we have with us Milka. Milka, you need to, to help me pronounce your second name before I, I make another <laughs> terrible no error. No problem. Pietikainen. Pietikainen. Yes. Thank you. Milka joins us um, from Millicom. Um, and uh, we'll be sharing quite a few insights on business um, and, and, and efforts to really access um, that next billion we're talking about this afternoon. And last but certainly not least, we have with us Ulf Persson. Is that correct? Perfect. Thank you. Doing well. Vice President Ericsson, based right here in Sweden. We're going to have an exciting discussion this afternoon because we are talking about the next billion. Now, on, on your... Uh, on your little sheets, it probably says the last billion, does it? But I think we'll start talking about the next billion mm -hmm. and then get to the last billion because we're assuming we've got m more than one billion to reach. Um, I'm going to start with you, Sonia. Give us the research, the data. What have you discovered in terms of the patterns uh, of, of access and affordability across the globe? Thank you. Thank you for having me here. Well, um, I think the most striking uh, finding from our research, which I urge you to look at uh, our affordability report on our website, is that um, for the 46 countries that we covered in our research, about 2 billion people live under the $2 a day poverty line. Uh, that means that for that 2 billion people, affordable internet is by far a dream, not even, even close to be a dream yet. It's far from being attainable, and that's a problem. That's why we are working uh, on policy and regulatory reform at for ai to try to create the conditions, and through working with the different stakeholders in the countries, to create the conditions that will then allow and make uh, affordable internet a reality in the countries. So the research not only shows that there's a large majority of populations in the developing world that uh, cannot afford, but even those that we believe may be, as you said, the next billion that may be able to afford, uh, the internet is still very uh, expensive for them. Uh, first of all, access is still an issue, so it's not even accessible in many countries. But then when it's accessible, affordability remains the key barrier uh, to users um, in most of the developing world. And so um, I think you know, those are uh, figures that are very important for us to consider, as well as the fact that uh, in most of the developing world, about uh, the prices of the internet are about 30% of monthly incomes, and in many countries in Africa and in Southeast Asia, it can be as high as 100%. So again, for those populations, uh, there's a lot of work that needs to be done uh, for them to be able to enjoy the kind of benefits that all of us here in this room are enjoying and take for granted. And uh, that's the kind of uh, work that we are advocating for. So uh, we work on policy and regulatory reform, as I mentioned earlier, in many different ways, but uh, working closely with the, uh, all the stakeholders, not just at the international level, but primarily and most importantly at the national level, at the country level, so that we can understand, first of all, what are the priorities so that we can connect uh, the next uh, masses of people 
uh, to the internet, but also what are the key barriers in their countries that need to be addressed from a policy and regulatory perspective. And we work through a multi-stakeholder model that we've been talking a, a lot about uh, here today. Um, and we believe that that is a very important model to make sure that the dialogue is informed, inclusive, and also one where uh, the policy process is one that is built at the same time, not just through uh, good research that we also provide and many others that are our members and partners, but also that um, you know, the, the kind of concrete proposals and recommendations for reforms are informed by lessons, by experiences, and also by the desires that the stakeholders in those particular countries uh, have as far as their priorities. If the priority is, for example, focusing on infrastructure versus focusing on spectrum policy, or at the same time focusing on some of those issues. And so we work through that very strong coalition model to uh, really focus on creating those conditions for healthy competitive markets and markets where affordability and access can be a reality for all, not just for those that have the incomes now, but especially for marginalized populations that live under poverty and that are more likely not to have access, including women uh, and many others, rural populations, etc. We'll, we'll be talking more about that. By the way, I just want to let everybody know that you are able to tweet your questions. We will take questions from the floor, but you can also tweet them. It's hashtag SIF14A. Please, that's what you'll use. We have our digital curators on the team there, and they'll be sharing some of your questions in just a short while. Before I leave you, Sonia, very briefly, I want to get an indication of what kind of cooperation you get from regulatory authorities in the national environments you work in. Very briefly, please. Mm -hmm. uh, we actually have been really uh, well supported by the regulatory agencies. We are now already actively working in Nigeria, Ghana, and Mozambique. Uh, all of uh, the countries, not only we've signed MOUs with uh, each of the respective governments, but also have the commitment and the support of not only the regulatory agencies, ministries across the different sectors that we see as very critical in the dialogue because we see the internet and ICTs as a platform for development in general. So it's not just about access to the internet, but what are the possibilities that the internet brings about to development. Absolutely. So we also work with education, health, agriculture, industry, etc. And then, of course, we bring together as an alliance ourselves and within the countries uh, also other stakeholders uh, within the private sector and, very importantly, civil society organizations that work also across the board, not just for ICTs, within ICTs, but also in sectors that are very much using ICTs as a platform for service delivery, for uh, product delivery, what have you. And that, that brings me to Judith, your experience on the ground. <clears throat> we know access to the in internet has been transformational across sectors um, on the African continent. Mm -hmm. But there are huge challenges, even in countries where, you know, there's been huge efforts to make sure that broadband is available um, across the country. So let's, let's just talk about what the challenges are on the ground. Mm -hmm. Um, and what the best practices are to address those challenges. Give us some instances of things that you've seen that have been transformational. Uh, thank you very much, Julie. Uh, it's good to be here this afternoon. I will approach it from accessibility for persons with disability. Okay? Um, this is the one billion that is actually forgotten. Right? Um, you talk about accessibility, it's about being able to get a product and a service like any other person, but does not happen when it comes to the persons with disability. And so, uh, what has been happening on ground? Very few persons with disability are able to actually get the service and the product that they need. So as much as the world is moving forward with the privacy issues, we have a whole stakeholder left behind that is not connected. Yeah. And this is because of infrastructure issues? What, what are the challenges? Um, affordability, because um, there are instances that will need assistive technology. Okay. So to make them available, more especially in, in developing countries, and make them 
not only available but affordable. And then secondly also, I mean the stakeholders really need to, to come together, the technical community, they need to understand um, when I have my website up there, who is my target, mm -hmm. yeah? What percentage is going to achieve, um, is going to receive the information that I'm putting online, and which percentage am I leaving out? And um, not to bash out even the, the SIF that we are in right now, we don't have captioning. So if there's anybody here with a hearing disability, they're not able to follow this. Right, if they can't read. And, you know, these are the things we forget, and we appreciate that we have you here because yes. you are reminding us mm -hmm. and telling us that technologies must also be adaptable. Yes. We must be able to consider these issues. I'll come back to you, Judy, right. on that in just a short while. Let's talk uh, from a commercial perspective now. Um, and um, it's great to have both Ericsson and also Millicom on board to share your experiences, particularly with respect to accessing the people that Sonia has been talk talking about, those who are finding it uh, you know, a huge challenge even just to afford to get on the internet. What's Tigo doing about it? Hmm. Um, so, so Millicom is a, is a telecommunications company that works in, in 15 markets across Africa and, and Latin America under the brand name of Tigo. So I think most of you might know Tigo, but not know Millicom. We have how, how many know Tigo? Okay, okay that, great. Great. there we have it. <laughs> great. We also have very strong links to Sweden. We are listed in Sweden. Our founder was Swedish, so um, that's probably why, why we're also here. Um, so affordable access is really for us um, everyday life um, because of the markets where we operate. I, I think just to give you a little bit of idea what we talk about affordability, what we mean in, in Africa, the average revenue of our customers in Africa is um, three and a half dollars per month. Um, and actually 40% of our, all of our customers across our, our footprint uh, bring uh, revenue of less than $1 a month. So this is the kind of prices that um, broadband should come to um, for it to be available to, to the broader masses. Um, and there was talk about a lot of our, most of our customers are prepaid customers um, because I think one, um, another very defining factor of our customer base is the irregularity of income um, of people. So that's something that we need to address in the way that we bring uh, the services to them. Um, so 93% are, are um, sorry, prepaid customers. Um, and um, we have uh, 52 million customers um, uh, across of our markets. Um, half of those about are, are, are in Africa. And I would like to um, talk about more about this um, innovation um, around access. Um, and exactly on, on um, how do you address the reality of the irregularity of the incomes, but also the, um, the affordability um, side? Um, I think we're quite stuck in our Western uh, way of understanding um, broadband and, and having um, uh, illimited access um, um, in, um, for, for, uh, on a, that we pay on a monthly basis. Um, our customers buy um, data prepaid. Uh, so we are, for example, introducing data to, to our customers when they're buying uh, bundles of uh, voice and SMS, for example. So they get um, a couple of megabytes of, of, of data at the same time as, as, as they buy their usual voice and SMS, and they can try out services. Um, we put on caps for daily usage um, so that people don't um, overuse right. and spend uh, too much than, than, uh, than they can afford. Um, and then it's, it's, I think it's very kind of everyday barriers to, to access as well. What is preventing people from trying um, internet and trying new services, data services? Um, a lot of it is down to education. Um, we have 700,000 points of sale across our 15 markets. And so there's a lot of daily interaction with our customers and, and helping them to understand how they can take use of data, value added services, um, et cetera. Do you think there's also a challenge of relevant content? Yes, absolutely. For the African market. Yes, mm -hmm. yes um, absolutely. Um, obviously, we talked about in, in some of the previous um, discussions about mm -hmm. local language mm -hmm. and how important mm -hmm. that is. Um, we are part of the Facebook Zero campaign. So in, in Tanzania and Paraguay, um, we offer Facebook for free to our customers. And very importantly, when we've launched that service, it's been in, in, in local languages, in, in Guarani and, and in uh, Kiswahili. 
And, and that has obviously lowered the, the barrier also for, for people to access that. But also that you, know, you don't necessarily even need broadband or 3G to access the internet. That's another thing. There's a lot of innovation that I think mm -hmm. we are ignoring in, in these countries, um, also around of different ways of accessing the internet. Um, people are surfing by SMS, very simple USSD menus, for example. Um, and then we have uh, voice services, so people are, are accessing information with voice, they use voice commands, and, and they have information read to them. So that's also, you know, addressing some of the, the accessibility issues the around people who are literate. Thank, thank you for that. And, and you know, let's come to Ericsson now. Um, the, the big challenge, I think, the growth on, on the African continent in terms of, of you know, use of digital platforms has, has been phenomenal. Mm -hmm. And I think unexpected in many ways, uh, globally. Um, what's your strategy now? We talk about getting to the last mile. Mm -hmm. What is the Ericsson strategy? And, and who, for you, who are the next billion? Okay, let's uh, just remind ourselves that, that uh, affordability is, is the key factor, of course. And, and Ericsson is a proud member of the alliance, of course. But we've been working on, on, on affordability for, for more than 100 years, uh, all through the Ericsson history, to, to connect uh, the next million or billion or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. But I think we have to remind ourselves that affordability is very much about uh, scale. Otherwise, uh, you won't reach affordability. Globally, we have now reached some 7 billion mobile subscriptions. But still, a minority of those are mobile broadband, making it possible to access the internet. So the challenge is, of course, to not only grow the number of mobile subscriptions, and they will grow in the next five years by some 2 billion or so to reach more than 9 billion, but the proportion that will be on mobile broadband will actually be very high. Some 80-90% will actually be on, on mobile broadband. But still, going to the Africa situation, Still, we only have a penetration of some 70%, 72% in Africa, and the majority of them are still on 2G, I mean voice and SMS. So the challenge then is to reach, uh, of course, 100%, but also a much higher proportion on, on, on mobile broadband. And we, the technologies are there, and uh, affordability is coming, especially through the smartphone. Most people on this planet will access uh, the internet over their smartphone. And we have forecasted that the number of smartphone subscriptions will grow three times in the next five years, from less than two billion to close to six billion. And that will be the way to access the internet. And coming to affordability, uh, we know that for... And, and we see, of course, the prices of mobile devices, smartphones, actually, uh, uh, coming down. So for every $10, the price of a smartphone comes down, there will be maybe 100 or 150 million people globally that will be able to access this technology. So we look very positively to, to, to the uh, development in the next few years. So this is an aggressive move towards making it more and more affordable for customers. And let's talk about other interesting patterns. We're going to come to the digital curators in a moment to get some of the, the, the Twitter feedback. Um, but I just want a quick overview um, from from Sonia, you first. What other global patterns are interesting to note? Uh, in terms of affordability, or you mean in terms in of terms the sector? In terms of access, developed? in terms of access, yeah. yes, and well, affordability. What I think, what I would like to share with you is that. Uh, I mean, there's a few patterns that are consistent with what at A4AI we call best practices in policy and regulation. And uh, basically, they give you guidance on the kinds of things, really the kinds of conditions that we're trying to achieve when we work on reform processes in different countries. So, you know, some things may seem very uh, kind of obvious. You know, everyone knows that we're trying to move towards very healthy, effective, competitive markets. However, just simply having a market that is competitive, it doesn't necessarily mean that it will be effective or that it will result in true affordable prices simply because a number of operators are competing. So we have examples in Africa where you have a, new, a, a large amount of operators in a particular market and uh, instead of that kind of competition or expected competition because of seven or eight or nine operators as you have you know, in Ghana or Uganda uh, resulting in true affordable prices, you end up having 
uh, quite serious imbalances in the market because of you know access operators, when uh, which then leads regulators and policymakers to realize well what was wrong. It's not just about the number of operators; it's about the rules of the market. It's about having very clear anti-competitive safeguards. It's also about clear uh, guidelines on how the different operators and all the different pieces of the puzzle are working in the marketplace. And so, for example, having, uh, allowing operators that already have licenses for specific kinds of spectrum to be able to use their spectrum for different kinds of technologies is one way in which you make operators being more flexible, being more and, uh, nimble as to how they can um, change and adapt and also innovate within the conditions that they have in the market to then serve those in the market in ways that are more uh, interesting and ultimately more affordable also. So the way we look at an effective healthy market is not just simply about the number of operators but is about is a licensing regime one that uh, is technology neutral, is service neutral, is, uh, you know, are, are such issues as anti-competitive safeguards clear? Are the market behaviors clear? Are we allowing price wars to actually destroy some of the progress that has taken place in the market? or are we preventing that to take place? So those are some of the ways in which you look at, uh, and, and that we hope to see these trends moving in many different countries and regulators, that's why we work very closely with them, being very aware and monitoring their markets very clearly so that they can quickly uh, not react to the problem, but anticipate some of the issues and some of the problems that are taking place so they can uh, fix some of those imbalances. And that also takes place, you know, some other trends, as you asked, you know, it's not just about the level of competition and, uh, you know, really the, uh, the effective competitive outcomes, but also other ways, which I think are very much related to what Wolf was mentioning, um, as far as how do you reduce the cost structures to then uh, impact on price. I mean, we're talking about affordability. Uh, it's not just about competition, but what can we do beforehand so we can reduce the entire cost structure to provide the service and ultimately have better prices to everyone. And so one of the many areas that we work to try to reduce those cost structures is, for example, infrastructure sharing. And how can we not only encourage, but be very clear about how infrastructure sharing uh, can reduce not only investment costs for each single operator, but how can it also reduce operating costs for operators. And some operators actually, uh, not just in Africa, and Latin America and Asia, have been quite innovative uh, around infrastructure sharing uh, um, you know, deals including uh, Millicom and Tigo and, and a few others, but we, we haven't done enough. We, there's a, quite a bit more that needs to take place. So see, these are some of the trends, let's say, that we see, but we want to see more and we want to push further ahead. Right, I, I want to just investigate further the, the whole idea of infrastructure sharing because Tigo, yeah. you've mentioned, is one of the companies that has done that. Mm -hmm. um, most operators will resist it immediately, you know, they don't, ordinarily want to work with a competition. Um, there's just a lot of suspicion around those kinds of issues. So how have you made it work where, where it is working? Uh, well, we must be um, among the exceptions because we, we embrace that uh, mm -hmm. very much. Maybe it's because we are one of the smaller players as well. Um, so we see a lot of advantage. We're able to increase our, our penetration, our coverage, geographical coverage in the countries much faster by sharing infrastructure with our competitors than we would be able to do um, on our own. Um, um, what we've done actually in, in, in Africa in three of our markets, we've actually um, uh, sold out the physical structures, the tower structures, to a separate company to actually facilitate tower sharing. Um, so, um, and that way everyone is comfortable. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yes, right. yes. So we all have our, we, we still have our antennas on that, on that tower, but um, it's also, you know, uh, environmentally um, much, uh, and also in relating to operational costs as well, are, are mm -hmm. going to be much lower when, when you're, you know, fueling or... Um, that base station together. Okay, um, so it's also about implementing it su in such a way that all the partners are just comfortable with the relationship and, and you have somebody managing yes. the process. Um, and so no partner seems to have the upper hand over the other. Um, okay, I'm going to come back to you. Of 
coming to you with a big one, Judy. Okay. I'm on the way there. Well, let's talk a little bit about what you've seen in terms of best, best practice uh, globally. You know, things that maybe yourselves or other companies have implemented that have been game changers in terms of cost and, and access. I think we have to, to uh, look at a, a number of issues here. And I think it's important to understand that this is not something that we can deliver alone from, from industry as, as an operator or as a vendor, as Ericsson, uh, delivering the, 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 the technical infrastructure. Okay. Uh, as Sonia already alluded to, I think the, the regulatory environment is absolutely key. Uh, but not only then for the supply side. I mean, the fact that we are we need to build out the infrastructure so everyone is actually covered and have access to technology in that sense. I think we need to work a lot on the demand side, to speak. And here, governments have at least as an important role to develop the content, if you like. And, and Ericsson, as, as a member of the Broadband Commission for, for uh, uh, Digital Development, which was set up some four years ago in order to, to, uh, to reach the uh, Millennium Development Goals with the aid of ICT, uh, I think what, what the Broadband Commission has concluded and recommended is not only, I mean, to work on the, on the access side, I mean, to, to build out the infrastructure, but also to integrate ICT in areas like health, in education, in gender equality. So you integrate ICT in the national development plans. I think that's absolutely key if we are to, mm -hmm. to, uh, to uh, achieve affordability and accessibility. So, yes, of course, the supply side, I mean, the infrastructure, yes, we are a proud contributor there, but also from the uh, demand side, you need to work from governments on the right ICT policies, and not only for the sort of ICT sector, but for all sectors, because we know, of course, that ICT will enable uh, health, uh, education, uh, and, and many other sectors to, to develop. I think some very interesting programs, I was looking recently at, a, at a, an educational program for schools where it keeps track of school attendance, is able to monitor the performance of students in schools, but this was particularly implemented to keep the girl child in school, but you can see the scope of it widens and it starts to impact on so many other things. And that brings me to uh, my question for you, Judy. You've explained the challenges that uh, people who live with special needs have when it comes to use of technology and access to the internet. I want to widen that group a little bit and talk about the rural woman mm -hmm. who, again, speaks one vernacular language, mm -hmm. um, doesn't know how to use um, uh, these gadgets, mm -hmm. but she's a farmer and she needs to access markets. Let's talk about the young man, you know, maybe the Maasai who is, is, is looking after some, some cattle, but is just learning how to use the phone. But what, what is he going to do? on this gadget? Can he access a market with it? What is he going to do? So l let's just take a look at the challenges they face mm -hmm. in affordability first and foremost. Mm -hmm. And what needs to be done? Are you doing anything? Do you know of people doing proactive things? But second of all, in, in training. Um, thank you. Indeed, a lot needs to be done in the capacity building area. Mm -hmm. um, just like it was shared here in the morning, though we were talking about privacy, uh, when people get online, then um, do they know how much information they are giving online? Yeah, that was what was being discussed here in the morning. Um, but now I am looking at this lady who is out there in the market. I know that in Kenya there are initiatives that uh, deal with farmers, um, that they have their coffee and they can quickly just use their little mobile phone and send an SMS and like, I have this amount of coffee and they can get it sold without really a third party being in between. Uh, and so I'll, I'll take it from the approach of a lot of um, capacity building is still needed. Um, it's not just a matter of having your mobile phone, but um, how do you use it? How, how effective is it going to be apart from, um, yes, I can talk to Julie, yes, I can find her. How much further can you use it? And I think I would encourage even the, the, the technical community with their applications, yeah, to be able to put up applications in as basic of a phone as possible, mm -hmm. that we can be able, like, if I'm in the um, farming, um, what can I be able to, um, to access with my 3,000, that could be a few dollars, um, Bob of a telephone, mm -hmm. yeah. So, 
just um, talking about capacity, yes. there remains a gap. So yes. we've got these, we do have organizations, Mukulima, yes. you know, yes. Wakulima, there's, you know, here, another one, Farm Kenya or Farm Uganda, doing innovative things. Mm -hmm. ICAO, I think, is one of them. I'm trying to remember the names. But are they reaching enough? of the targeted market mm -hmm. and and if not where's the disconnect and maybe i could bring that very briefly to each of you mm -hmm. i think i'll approach it from the um affordability i remember a few years ago uh, before uh, the fiber optic landed in kenya i mean that conversation was like oh we need to get online we need to get you know we need to get our acts together and and, and then it was online and do what? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I remember um, the, the former permanent secretary, Dr. Ndemo, saying that he is very afraid that the, that the fiber will land and will have nothing to do with it. Yeah. <laughs> and I remember um, the conversation at that point was like, once the fiber lands, it's going to be cheap. It's going to be cheap. It's going to be cheap internet. But unfortunately, yes, the fiber landed and it wasn't cheap. Right. Why? Because it was, there was return of investment. There has to be return of investment. The investor wants to know, how will I be able to cover what I have used? So you find it that the costs remain high. We have the 3G in Kenya, but the uptake is very small. Why? Because of the costs. Why? Because of the return of investment that the providers have to get. Okay, so ROI is, is the ROI. big challenge. So it comes yes. back to cost. I see everyone nodding. It comes back to cost. Is that what we are all saying? Yes. But Once but we start to see, but shouldn't we be looking at this from a long-term perspective rather than, yes, Sonia, you nod your head? That's a good question. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, obviously everyone, I mean, I can tell you that, uh, I mean, that's a very important question and, you know, understanding how uh, policymakers, but also especially the private sector governments and all of us, you know, the civil society can come together and see the benefits along term benefits of these investments and realize we don't have simply because the sector has been so dynamic and growing so fast in the last few years we don't necessarily have to have a hundred percent return on investment in three years mm -hmm. you know uh, not too many years ago 15 years ago it was expected the return on investment in our sector was 15 20 years and all of a sudden, because of the fast-paced development, uh, everything has to be in three, five years. Well, that really, especially now where we are in our sector as far as development, really uh, puts a lot of pressure on costs. So one of the things that I'm hoping we can also work, not just with our members, many of, women of whom are here in this room, uh, but to make sure that uh, we can think of innovative ways of also thinking of investment and return on investment. You know, people like using the, the cash cow, you know, um, concept for uh, our sector. You know, it's the easy one to tax, it's growing, uh, let's, you know, squeeze it as much as we can out of it. The problem is, when you do that, you have impact in many different ways, mm. including on investment, if that's the case. And, and we can't allow that. We need to sustain the sector as well in the long term. So you're losing out on so many other gains and possible rev revenue collection from, from other businesses yeah. by, by I mean, the same way, I don't wish to see, and I hope governments will be thoughtful when they think about taxing the sector, mm -hmm. taxing the users, taxing the equipment, taxing the infrastructure, I mean, mm -hmm. the equipment that comes into the country to, uh, to be uh, laid out uh, for networks. The same way, investors should think, well, if we're going to be able to do this right, perhaps we need to be a little bit more flexible about our return on investment right. time frames. Right. Mm -hmm. I see Milka and Ulf nodding their heads. So Milka, go, go ahead. Yeah. Um, so we are, we are one of the investors. So, um, yes. Um, so obviously, you know, and, and we are a business, so of course we're looking for return on investment. Uh, just to give you a picture on, on what kind of investments we're talking about, particularly in these markets where you're still building the basic infrastructure, so you're still 
both uh, building the geographical coverage of the countries to, to the more remote areas, but you're also building capacity as 3G is coming. Um, so there's a lot of investment. Last year, 24% of all of our revenues went into capital investments, mm -hmm. into infrastructure. 200 million of those went to Spectrum. So we also pay, obviously, Spectrum mm -hmm. licenses on licenses on, on top of the, the infrastructure investments. So, so the investments are not insignificant. But I think um, we need to look at the kind of, I think, the total cost of ownership um, here, like what, what Sony was, was saying, it, it's not just about us getting a return on our investment, it, it's about um, the government having um, um, policies in place that are favorable um, for, for people to take, up, take these, these technologies into use. Um, taxes, um, yes, of course, companies should pay income taxes and employment taxes, etc. But we're seeing increasing amount of taxes on services that we provide minutes of use, uh, megabytes of use. Um, we have we are taxed on on the money that that moves in the mobile financial services. We are a big provider of mobile financial services as well. We're paying a percentage on those, um, and we're starting to see also some very prohibitive um, uh, actions as well. For example, specific amounts um, per user per month type of taxation, which is really going to not not help the uh, the, right. the next billion uh, to come in, and then it comes down to devices and smartphones and 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 those the device prices going down, which is it they are coming down quite significantly, but I would say more so in Latin America at the moment. Um, mm -hmm. So we're approaching about fifty dollars for for the lower end smartphones, and and what we are seeing is that when you get to those levels, there's a really big acceleration in 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 the pickup. Um, of those, and of course, we are also heavily subsidizing because we're seeing that there is a huge demand in the markets for for social media, for internet to to access. Thank you. Of your thoughts. Yes, just to say that I agree with with the, the risk of overtaxing this fast-growing sector because it can bring such tremendous benefits when, when networks are being rolled out, and, and obviously costs are coming down, but but not not fast enough as we see it. Uh, and of course, as Ericsson, we, we, we can provide different solutions how, how to, I mean, we talk about shared networks and managed capacity, etc. But I think it's interesting what, what we have been doing in, in, in particular in Africa, in so-called Millennium Villages, where together with the Earth Institute and Millennium Promise, we have actually connected together with customers, uh, uh, villages, rural villages in 12 African countries for the first time, actually connecting 500,000 people uh, with both voice communication then and internet connectivity over mobile networks. And uh, I think that's an excellent example where you can uh, showcase the, the tremendous positive development impact of, of connectivity. And I think that in this partnership, and it needs to be sort of a public partner, public private partnership, and uh, we're working here together with our customers, and they, I think, sometimes are being surprised to see the strong demand and also willingness to pay for these services that are being brought to, to, to people in these rural areas for the first time. So I think it's an underestimation also mm -hmm. of, of the willingness to, to invest quite a large proportion. I mean, of course, I, I can agree that we need to bring down the, the, the uh, proportion of disposable income that you should spend on, on, on broadband connectivity, but still there's a strong willingness of people uh, to, to invest in these uh, services. To get that access. Because they bring right. such tremendous uh, uh, benefits to you privately, but also uh, uh, in, in your jobs and so on. Two, two very interesting things. One of the counties uh, in Kenya actually tried to uh, make sure that access to the internet was available for all. Mm -hmm. I'm told it went up and then went down and now <laughs> goes up and down. Um, we'll follow up that story and see what impact that does have on, on, on the county. But also f on a tour of Turkana where the Horn of Africa drought, the epicenter of the drought, um, we happened to go with one of our mobile operator uh, CEOs. The people begged for uh, a mask to be put up mm. and, and, and to have access to, to the network. And they did so. And went back a year later and found, these people said thank you. Because every time we got raided, the cattle raids, mm -hmm. We had no way to call anyone. Mm -hmm. And it was days before anybody knew the situation was dire. Mm -hmm. and, and that just understanding mm -hmm. the responsibility of our mobile operators, even when it comes to security for the people. Mm -hmm. and, and so the balance, I guess, between profits and, and also a social responsibility is a huge balance. Um, digital curators, mm -hmm. over to you, please. What do we have coming in on Twitter? The mic, please. There. Not yet. Could you keep trying? 
Okay. No? In the mean, ah, oh, there. Am I heard now? Okay. Thanks, Julie. There are some um, responses from the digital audience as well, and uh, mostly they reflect what is being ta talked here and discussed. Uh, but let me raise them nevertheless, and we, we can maybe uh, get a sense of what the digital audience want to hear and want to share <clears throat> digital as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so some people are seeing affordable internet as a dream, which is the most pessimistic and you know uh, more, most pessimistic uh, view uh, shared on online. So we can see quite a lot of them who think that affordable internet, uh, especially for the, the, the developing world, is is a dream to a large majority. Um, and most of the people want to see more concrete measures um, than the ones discussed or raised here. Uh, for instance, I think one question tackled Ericsson's role uh, to take the initiative to face the challenges uh, for innovation, for affordable technology to reduce the costs, especially in rural Africa. Of course, there are thematic concerns as well. One of them is gender, and Africa is, all, um, is also very a big uh, concern for the audience, digital audience. I'm, uh, we can sense, I can, I can see that most comment, commentary are coming from Africa, which is um, nice, actually. Um, it's great. <laughs> but, um, for instance, one question says, what can be done to make sure that more people are online, especially in the developing world? And also, um, there are some alternative views that, you know, People think that affordable internet and also access to internet are not only about infrastructure and prices, but it also requires uh, more info education and contents for uh, people with less free time. So it's an alternative, alternative view of uh, access to internet which um, kind of transcends the, um, the, the money um, and the cost and, and the infrastructure uh, point of view. Uh, and people share, of course, as you speak here, people share a really valuable stats to see the bigger picture, to, to understand the bigger, bigger picture. Um, statistics about numbers about mobile subscription, especially in, 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 in Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa, and uh, the gender divide between uh, the males and females and their access to internet in, in Sub-Sahara, which hits now 45, 45%, which is uh, a, major, a major concern for our digital audience as well. And lastly, um, not least actually, uh, people also ask about this one billion, who are the next billion mm. we need to get online? Are they defined or should they be defined by age, gender, region or profession? Um, and we'll keep, keep on monitoring you. the digital world for you. Thank you, thank you to everyone sending tweets in. I think Sonia, you had tried to define them, but we'll, we'll delve into that a little bit more in a short while. First, I want to go to the floor. I see a hand over there, a gentleman, I think in a gray jacket, We'll start there. I see some hands on this end as well. Please introduce yourself. Tell us what you do and ask your question or make your comment. Thank you very much. My name is Ali Akbar Musavi. I'm from Iran, but I live in the United States since 2009. I'm a human rights uh, activist. My qu I have two questions. Uh, the first question is that, from, especially from Sonia, uh, as you know, recently Facebook and Google has annou have announced uh, uh, about a project uh, to cover whole or whole world with drones. What do you think about uh, this project? Because the the main purpose of that project are about affordability, and also you know that previously Google uh, has done a project balloons, what was the result of that? And the second question is about since Asian countries have produced uh, more affordable products, services around the world, what's the, their role, like, like India, China, or other countries like you know, uh, Indonesia in that regard to make internet more affordable? Thank you. Thank you very much. There's two ladies here, I think. Um, can we bring the mics to this side? And we'll get the two comments from the ladies. Is there anyone on this side? I'll come, I'll come here next, thank you. Um, hi everyone, I'm Nanjira from Nairobi, Kenya. Um, my question is um, on the issue of net neutrality that is not coming up in this particular panel. As we talk about um, you know, 
making affordable um, internet for all, we must talk about who's making it affordable and what then people will be able to access. And I think this is part of the problem of these people, the next billion being faceless, that we are then not talking about who has then the right or who makes them, the, or who um, avails the point of um, access and what they are able to access. So I would really like to hear that from the panelists here because I think it would be a bit disingenuous not to talk about it. Thank you. The lady in, just in front. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dorothy Okello from Uganda. Uh, my question is actually for the telcos. Uh, in many of our countries, uh, the telcos have uh, good access to our governments, uh, have a good ear to our governments, and uh, in the context of internet freedom for development and affordable access, what role do you believe you can play in promoting a balance between internet freedom and security, given the favored position you have in our countries? Thank you. Powerful questions, and I think I'll start with that question posed by Dorothy, and it's a critical question. We hadn't addressed the issue of security, which is a serious concern in, in quite a number of states. Um, and of course, therefore, access becomes an issue. Um, and what Dorothy is asking is, you know, the telcos and a lot of the big business players have good relationships with governments. What are you doing um, and what role can you play in this space? Let me start with you, Milka. Um, yes, we have relationships with the governments, obviously, because as mobile operators, we operate under a license that is granted by, by, uh, by the government. Um, what leverage do we have in that situation is another question, um, um, which isn't, I, I, I think, which isn't um, particular to uh, our markets or in the developing world. I think it applies, applies everywhere, what leverage do operators have who, who operate under a license from the government and who are obliged, obviously, to, re to respect local law. Um, at the same time, I have to say that in, in, uh, particularly in, in some markets in particular, which I think are more mature and where you have more, uh, more competition and more operators in one place, there is quite um, um, good discussions on a number of issues, um, whether it's on child online protection or, or um, electronic waste or whether it's on, uh, around privacy and, and freedom of expression. One of the challenges for us in many of our markets is that there aren't, particularly in Africa, there aren't many laws in place or regulations in place regarding these issues. Um, so obviously that's something where we do have an interest in, in having a discussion with the government and making sure that whenever um, those measures or those laws are being discussed or implemented that they are as transparent and as clear as possible in, in the process, in the due process, so that it is as easy as possible for us to, to um, not only assess the legality of requests, but then also be able to reject requests that are not fitting into the law. Of your thoughts on this issue? Yes, just to, to, to start out by saying, of course, we play somewhat different roles in the value chain here. Uh, we don't work under a license from the government. We are a provider to mm -hmm. operators that work under a license from the government. So we have different roles. Of course, the, the issue of security is a very wide one. One is, of course, resilience of the networks. And, of course, and, and there I can guarantee you that that's a top priority for a company like Ericsson to ensure the, the, uh, that the networks are stable, that they are not uh, collapsing. We have what we call the five nines, 99.999 percent of the, of the time the network should be up and running. That allows us for five minutes downtime. So that's one important aspect. Privacy is another one, which was the, the uh, subject of a previous debate here uh, this morning. And in, in some countries, we are acting on behalf of the operators in what we call managed services. So we are actually running the networks 24-7 uh, and, and maintaining them on behalf of the operators. And there I can assure you as well, I mean, a company like Ericsson, the privacy of the data that relate to, to uh, the uh, uh, subscribers is uh, absolutely fundamental to, to, to us in that role. So, so, I mean, we do our utmost there. And then I just can, can agree that when it comes to, uh, although we are not the, the object of and, and not sort of targeted with, with, uh, with uh, requests from governments on, on, on data, uh, etc., uh, uh, I can just agree with, with, uh, with Milka here that that needs to be handled in, in a very uh, transparent and, 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 and clear process uh, based in law and, and so on. Right. I think it's interesting you say with respect to privacy, you do your utmost. And I'd love to yes. prod and investigate what, what is utmost? Yes. How far does utmost go? It goes very, very far. Mm -hmm. I mean, of course. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. 
Okay. Because I mean, I mean, we, I mean, we are a listed company. I mean, we we have uh, we have investors, we have uh, uh, NGOs that that care about how we handle these. So you're things. saying you have to be transparent. No, we want to be transparent, uh -huh. but we have expectations on us as well. Okay. So. We, we could delve into this. It's not the focal point of this discussion nope. today, but, but it is interesting. Yeah. If we have but time, I'll come back yeah. to if it. I'm just me, sorry. Yes, go ahead. Sorry, if I may say one, one word on that. Mm -hmm. I think the equipment manufacturers, I think they, they do play an important part. And it's not only the physical equipment. There's also a lot of software uh, services that, that we buy, right. buy from them. And I think they do play an important part in privacy, in, in data privacy, creating systems and, and, and products that do keep data secure. So from, from that perspective, um, there is definitely an important... I, I think huge, element. huge issues around data security yeah. and privacy, and this has been discussed already today, so rather than go back into it, um, let's move to Nanjira's question now. And uh, Nanjira says, you know, let's talk about net neutrality. Let's talk about whose role is it exactly to make access affordable? Where does the buck stop? I'm going to start with you, Ulf, and Milka, and then Sonia coming to you and Judith. Yeah, there are different things in here. So net neutrality first. I think we can, we can spend probably half an hour just debating what net neutrality <laughs> is. is. Okay. But I mean, of course, uh, Ericsson, we would be against any blocking or discrimination, etc., in the networks. Uh, so that's absolutely clear. Uh, and, and I think affordability is, is, is a, a different issue. Uh, but uh, I mean, net neutrality, yes, uh, as I defined it, we're, we're definitely uh, for that. And uh, at the same time, we have to recognize, and, and uh, being a provider to probably 40% of the mobile networks around the world, in order for any operator to be able to deliver high quality services to you as the subscriber, as the end user, uh, the and the, because these are, are highly sort of complex uh, technologically, uh, these networks, uh, especially the, the mobile networks, uh, there, there is a room for, for the operator in order to deliver that quality of service. You need to manage the traffic in, in, in a responsible way. And there should be clear rules about that. And I think there are in, in most places around the world. Okay. Yeah, that, that's an, actually an excellent question. Um, so who, who should decide? what internet and, and, and who, obviously we're talking about affordability, so and I think we're all working towards more affordability and making internet available to as wide a population as possible as an operator. That's of course what we want, we want more customers. Um, uh, yes, the, it, net neutrality is a complex issue on, on you know, uh, managing data in the networks, ensuring quality of service. Um, when it comes to affordability, yes, um, this is something that I also debate myself. Um, mm -hmm. Because when we, when we talk about value-added services, which is one of the main ways I would say that our, many of our customers are now accessing data, what we call data services, so the n next generation from voice and, voice and SMS, they're still they're limited to the services that we provide. So that does, you know, of, of course, uh, bring, bring the limit. So that's why I think 3G and moving into that space and, and having the device prices come down on the smartphone side and, 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 and expanding the, the, the mobile broadband in general is really going to be key for, for that universal access. But with respect to the question who, where, who is responsible? You said it's a debate you, you have, do you not have an answer? <laughs> from our perspective, the customers should be the ones who decide. And, and um, from what we see now is, is that there is a huge demand for, from our customers, for example, for social media is extremely popular with our customers. So a lot of the services that we bring to them at this point are very focused on, on that Facebook, Twitter, on different methods, whether it is with through internet or, or something else. And that's the first. Okay, so, Sonia, you had a specific question um, <laughs> yes, <laughs> for um, you, but before you come to it, maybe you'd like to comment on the other two as well. Um, I'll start with the questions. Okay. I mean, with, I, I mean, I can tell you just generally, so we don't go into too many details, uh, just as we believe in technic technologically neutral licenses and service neutral licenses, we also think the networks need to be as neutral as possible, mm -hmm. and net neutrality is a very important issue um, in many regards. So, but going to, so there's a few questions uh, to meet from you and from the audience. Um, I'm not going to speak uh, on behalf of Google. I think there might be some Googlers here in the room, so hopefully they can Google, also are you represented uh, here? share. What I would like to say is that A4AI, and Google is one of our members uh, as well, as well as Facebook and many other uh, companies. Um, 
but what we, the way I see it is that um, innovation is important in all respects, especially when you're thinking about affordability. Uh, it's important that innovation is there, that is supported, that is encouraged, uh, especially the kinds of innovative solutions that will indeed drive down the costs. However, and this is why one of the things that I always say to you know, our colleagues at Facebook, at Google, or any other company, regardless of the innovation that you have, if you don't have the right policy framework or regulatory framework, your technological innovation cannot go very far. And so it's very important for us that those innovations are supported, but at the same time that there's a framework that you can benefit from them. If I'm thinking, if I'm uh, focusing, as I mentioned earlier, which is our focus on populations that have very limited incomes, they're living in uh, rural areas, uh, et cetera, you want to make sure that those populations are reached by innovative solutions. And this, the ones that you mentioned um, in your question are some of them. It would be wonderful to see good results from them uh, in the near future. But such are also innovations around uh, spectrum uh, that many companies are exploring to figure out ways of providing uh, more affordable mobile broadband. Uh, and that's, that's really what is our focus, is pushing innovation that is going to provide solutions there are creative, but at the same time are really focusing on lowering the cost of provision. Mm -hmm. And with, with that, I also wanted to add that, uh, you know, we were talking about uh, Spectrum earlier and mobile broadband and the fact that uh, one of you mentioned that for the most part, many uh, people will first access the internet through a mobile device. Well, the reality, even the very recent numbers that the ITU published uh, two weeks ago about uh, put the numbers on mobile broadband very low as far as penetration, even though there are some uh, more users of the internet in, through many different pl platforms, the truth is if either fix or even mobile broadband, it's a very, very small percentage of people who actually can afford purchasing it. So in Africa you have, I think the new, newer statistics are about 19% of the population uh, actually can and purchases subscriptions of mobile what, what broadband. Is the what is the pattern of growth though? Uh, the pattern of growth in Africa is quite large, but what I would like to say is that Africa is a large continent of 50-something uh, countries. And so the countries that I'm working in, uh, Nigeria, Ghana, Mozambique, and others that we are uh, working with already uh, as well, we see penetration rates are far below that, mm -hmm. even the, the continent average. So in Mozambique, uh, there's not even 1% uh, mobile broadband penetration. In uh, Nigeria, we're getting close to about 18, 19%. In Ghana, we, you know, if we're lucky, maybe by the end of this year, we'll be in the 10%. And when you think of affordability, in fact, Alison was here earlier on, the, on stage from Research ICT Africa. Their research has shown clearly that uh, it's not just about the barrier of the cost, which is one of the most important barriers, to many in Africa, but it's also the fact that women make about 40% less uh, incomes mm -hmm. than men, and so they they have an even additional barrier to get to those, to be able to afford those kinds of services that are now available. If you think about uh, people with uh, special needs, we're working with some coalitions in Nigeria, for example, of um, advocates for spe people with special needs, and uh, their statistics show that a larger percentage of populations with special needs are also poor, mm -hmm. a much larger percentage. Mm -hmm. So those, to me, it always comes down to cost, and innovation is very important as far as it's going to hopefully allow for that. But it, right now, it's an experimentation. Okay, just, just very quickly, Sonia, the other question that was put was, you know, Asia seems to be doing better at managing costs. Mm -hmm. um, what can we learn from Asia? Mm -hmm. What's well, in fact, uh, yes, and I, I guess one of you asked the question about some other countries. One of the things that we do in the regions is that we work with some of the countries where some good lessons can be learned. Mm -hmm. And some of you mentioned Malaysia, uh, Kenya in, in Africa, Colombia in Latin America, India in, as far as rural development as well. And we also um, hoping to work with many of those governments, some of which we are already uh, engaging with, so that we can exchange those lessons 
lessons and uh, facilitate a more South-South dialogue, really, with the countries that we work in so that we can learn from each other about those experiences. Malaysia, for example, was considered, I mean, in our research, in our affordability report, was actually uh, ranked number one in the developing world. And one of the reasons why that was the case was precisely because of their very innovative policy of using government uh, funds to support not only investment, but to support content uh, development, mm -hmm. as well as uh, devices and the ability of purchasing devices by youth, uh, not just at schools, but actually special subsidies for youth to be able to purchase devices. And that's some, another area that we can talk about. It's the role of government of increasing and making sure that that demand is there and is supported and actually is also subsidized because Creating. for the most most part, you need though, that support. Creating capacity. Ulf, I know you want to address the issue of technology, but Judy, first I want to come with you. And um, I think Dorothy raised the issue of the balance mm -hmm. between some of the security issues. And, and you know, we're talking about access and affordability, but we're not talking about perhaps not talking enough about the capacity that needs to be created around that, even when you look at the morality of a society, okay. you know, and, and I speak specifically uh, because in very many of the environments that we're speaking of, when Sonia explains who the next billion are, there are they are volatile environments. Very um, many of them are, are socially unstable. Um, you know, have maybe governance issues. Um, therefore, where is the balance, and whose responsibility is it to ensure that as people get access, mm -hmm. it is responsible access? <laughs> wow. Uh, responsibility, I guess, um, lies on every internet stakeholder. We will, uh, we will police ourselves. Yes, mm -hmm. a responsibility lies with every one of us. Uh, about... Uh, can I just jump over to civil society and I might just shoot myself sure. in the foot, so... Jump? <laughs> jump over? <laughs> <laughs> I guess like the earlier question that had been asked about net neutrality. Mm -hmm. um, my take is the technology that we have right now, it's very difficult to have a yes or no answer. Yeah? Like who is to give us this? And I can easily say, no, it's the telcos. Because as he said earlier, I'm, I'm sorry I'm not able to pronounce your name. Both. <laughs> my, my colleague, uh -huh. I can call him that. <laughs> yeah, as he said earlier, um, we cannot be able to do it by ourselves. A telco cannot be able to achieve what we are expecting by itself. They'll need the service providers, they'll need government, uh, they'll need the civil society. So I guess it's, it's, not, it's not under one umbrella that we can be able to, f to fit all, all this. It's a responsibility for each and every other person. Self-regulation. We're going to have to do it. We're going to have to play that game. I saw two hands here, so I'm coming to you in just a moment. Very briefly, okay. if you wanted yeah. to contribute on the uh, issue of technology. A few words about the technology, because yes. I, I think we have to, to recognize, as I started out by saying that, that we have now reached 7 billion mobile subscriptions in the world. Mm -hmm. and, and that is based on open global standards, not based on an Ericsson technology or a Huawei technology or, or a Nokia technology, it's commonly owned. I mean, we are all invested in this technology as the operators. And it's open and everyone can, can, anyone can build a phone based on those, those open standards. And that has brought the scale and scale brings affordability. Mm -hmm. I think it's important to remind ourselves when there's a debate of, will there come some, some new innovative technology? I mean, we are investing $5 billion a year in, in innovation in Ericsson and, and, and so are our peers in the industry. So, so I think that, that there's a, uh, uh, pace is not uh, as, as high as it should be, probably, uh, because we, we still have these gaps in, in, in affordability and accessibility. Mm -hmm. But I think that uh, uh, the answer will not come from niche technologies or something like that that will revolutionize it. But uh, just to, uh, on, on the scale as well, and, and so there was the question of, on innovation, uh, can we learn from Asia, etc. I think we can all learn from each other. Right. We can learn a lot from Africa. We've seen that with connectivity, with access to this technology, innovation starts. And we've seen, um, 
not least in your home country, uh, when it comes to mobile payments, etc. And we know that there are two and a half billion people in the world that uh, don't have a bank account. Right. Two thirds of those actually have a mobile phone. And the technology is there, so with the right regulation, etc., uh, we can see uh, a, a large, uh, a fast growth of, of, of mobile services over mobile devices. Yes, sir. And, and that was actually started out in, 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 uh, in Africa. Right, so, so, so we saw M-Pesa and now the, right. the, the yeah. unbanked are being banked yes, on, yeah, their, yeah. on their mobile phones. The two questions, please, on this side, the gentleman there in the glasses, please. Julie. There's also some people on that side. Oh, there, I see. Okay. We're going to try and come up. Please make them as brief as possible. Thank you. Yes, I'm Tonya from the Philippines. I have two questions for the civil society uh, panelists. What do you think is the role of the state in bridging the digital divide? Uh, we've, we've been focusing on the private sector and civil society cooperation. What do you think should be the role of government or the state? Thank you. And, Give us your next one. And uh, in your view, what's the nature of internet access? Is it a value-added service? Is it a product? Is it a public utility? Uh, because that would color everything. Uh, how we view, uh, how we define affordability. Thank you. Thank you so much. Gentlemen, just in front of him, and then we'll go to the middle of the room. As quickly as possible, please ask your question. Okay, I have a very quick question. I just want to ask... Uh, but you may tell us who you are. My name is Kiss, <laughs> Kiss Abraham from, from Zambia. Thank I work you. with an organization called KBA Innovations. One billion uh, new people using technology means over one billion new tools. How far are we going with the fair phone? Because uh, I know that there's still this issue of conflict minerals. And, we, I, and I, I don't think this has been resolved yet. So I just want to know maybe from Ericsson how far we're going with that uh, process. Thank you. Someone in the middle had their hand up. The lady, thank you. Oh, yes. uh, hi, I'm Sarah Cortez from Tor Project and IPV Tech. And uh, Tor Project provides online anonymity, anonymity tools and research, as you know. And IPV Tech seeks to involve girls and women in technology training and uh, bridge uh, the technology world, uh, providing uh, access and help to girls and women. And so we're interested in involving girls and women in technology training and implementation. And my question is, with respect to implementing the internet uh, in developing nations, what is your advice on some of the best way to involve girls and women in technology training and actual hands-on participation in implementation? Thank you so much for that. I'm going to take just one more, and I have to take it right from the back of the room. OK, I see this gentleman here. We'll fit you in as well as, as she walks to the lady at the back. Go ahead with your comments. Thank you. It's, it's, Thank it's, it's you. very quick. My name is Carlos Dada. I am from El Salvador. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I was wondering if uh, internet is so important these days in our societies. If, if, shouldn't we consider it a public good and make mm -hmm. the states guarantee accessibility to it instead of leaving it only in the hands of private companies. Thank, Thank you, you for that. Thank you. The lady at the back. Uh, my name is Lydia from Uganda. My question is to the lady from Tigo. From your, from your understanding of the market, do you think there's any risk that as we move the next billion online, they'll actually lose some of the advantages we had got from non-online connectivity. For instance, when the next billion move online, what happens to M-Pesa? You know, is it, do you see any products being built to make sure that what they're doing on M-Pesa, they'll still be able to do online? You know, okay, thank you. Retain. We, we, Just one more question. We don't have time, Sonia. <laughs> Sonia has taken the session over. We're going to finish on time, sadly. I'm so sorry to everybody else who had questions. Um, so I I'm going to start with you on this side, Ulf. Um, you've heard the various different questions, and I'm going to allow you simply because we have only seven minutes less 
left to address the ones that are of okay. most interest okay. um, to you. So, um, yeah, that, first that was a direct question from the gentleman over there on, on conflict minerals. And, and uh, I can assure you that, that the industry, including Ericsson, is, is uh, working hard on this issue. We know that there is legislation already in the United States on that. There is legislation or recommendations be, being prepared within the European Union on that. Of course, it's a difficult uh, uh, subject, uh, and, uh, but I think industry is committed to uh, uh, avoid be, being complicit in, in, in any way in, in action that would uh, uh, aggravate the situation in, in those areas where, where these minerals are, be, being, uh, are coming from. So, so yeah, I can assure you that industry is strongly committed uh, on this area, and I'm happy to, to talk details about that. Can I just... Yes, yes. It, it, just as you go on, the, yeah. the one billion new tools, where are we? Sorry? The one billion new tools, as we connect the one billion new people, next, yes. the next billion, yeah. we need new tools. Where are we is one of the questions. Tools, you mean devices or what? I, th I think, do you mean the software? Do you ah. mean applications? Where is the Zambian? I think, I think devices. Yes, yes. What do you mean specifically? Uh, okay. More, more devices. Okay. Yes. okay. okay. Sustainability, you. I mean, if, if we talk about waste, etc., I think that's an also an area where, where, where we are working mm -hmm. hard in the industry. And Ericsson, actually, we, we took a decision already before European legislation on, on waste handling uh, of electronic devices to, to actually offer to our customers, the operators, that we will bring back and, and recycle uh, equipment in a responsible way in order to, to avoid e-waste. We're also involved in e-waste projects in Ghana, for example. Just a few words about uh, uh, education and, and uh, I think the gender issue on, on female education. And here Ericsson is actively involved in something called Connector Learn, which is about, uh, it's a global education project where we are not only, we are connecting villages as we do in the Millennium Villages, but we're also ensuring that, that ICT is used to provide what we call 21st century uh, uh, education. Uh, because ICT will revolutionize the education, it's a role start to do that, but and we are prioritizing girls here because we see that uh, secondary education for girls is uh, a challenging area and, and we are working hard on that to I bring 40,000 students in our projects. Thank you. Ed educating girls transforms communities. Yes. Milka, your thoughts on the different questions? We've had the one on, on, on uh, girls and access to uh, tech training for them addressed, but do you have any other ideas on that? Um, I think what we've seen, obviously, we recognize that there is this gender gap in adoption of, of mobile devices, so a lot of the customers that we still have to gain in for, for Tigo are, are going to be women, so this is uh, something that we're looking into. And um, We have a very interesting project we will, uh, happy to talk to you about, um, which relates to mobile financial services, so it's called Tigo Pesa, not M Pesa, for, uh, <laughs> from us, um, um, on where we're actually training women, um, we're providing microloans to, to women become entrepreneurs in, in the mobile financial services services space and this is really to, to see whether this has an effect on women's adoption of the service um, itself. We're working with the Cherry Player Foundation. Thank you. And Lydia, um, Lydia had a specific question yes, for on, you. I'm on, on, rushing yes, us along. On Tico, Tico Pesa. I don't know. I don't think there is a danger of losing these services that are working very well. On mm -hmm. the contrary, I think they will just exist in different types of technology platforms. They will exist in smartphones. We already see that in some of the most advanced markets in, in Tanzania. We already have that in, in smartphones. Half of our customers in Tanzania are using, using uh, Tico Pesa. Um, so I think you know some of it will evolve with the technology, but it will still be available. You shouldn't fear that it's not going to be available on the lower end devices that is available now. Thank you. Uh, Sonia, let me bring to you the question from the gentleman from El Salvador, and he says, shouldn't we view the internet as a public good? But also, uh, another very interesting question was posed, and, and somebody asks, you know, how do we view, you know, what's the nature of internet access? Uh, Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on those? Okay, so uh, on internet as a public good, I think you know what's very obvious to to us and to me is that uh, just as uh, mobile telephony and telephony in the old days was seen as a public good, it was really uh, the essence, the beginnings of the reason why uh, policy and regulation came into being was because we understood that just as any other public utility. Uh, the services in our sector are a public good, and as a public good, they should be 
uh, insured, they should be affordable, and they should be widely available to the, the greatest amount of people. And so, yes, indeed, that's very much at the core of any policy and regulatory framework uh, anywhere in the world uh, today. I don't think there's any doubt that some countries better than others, but also very much at the core of our advocacy. Um, as far as, there was another question also uh, from the Philippines on the role of the government right. on providing internet and also the definition of the internet. I think one thing I would like to say is that, uh, as you have heard earlier, we work very closely across the different sectors, across the different constituencies as an alliance. We ourselves see, our, see ourselves as a multi-stakeholder alliance, but we also work with multi-stakeholder coalitions that we establish in the countries um, that include the public the private and civil society organizations very strongly exactly because we see that all of them have a role to play, a very important role to play. Just as uh, women's organizations or uh, education organizations or what have you have a role to play in making sure that we understand the vision of ICTs and the internet for those groups, the government also needs to have a role, to has a, one critical role to play so that they can uh, transform their policy in a way that leads to achieving their visions of ICT and the internet for their countries and for the development of their countries at the social level, at the economic level, at, you know, if some people would argue even at the cultural level because the internet is changing our culture as well. And so it has an important role also as a key partner with the private sector. Uh, we don't have time to speak about that, but I urge you to look at our affordability report that actually has very specific recommendations on how civil society specifically, as someone asked me as well, uh, how civil society can engage in this process. <laughs> and we have very detailed recommendations on how to go about that. Thank so you look so at much it. For that. And I'm happy to talk to any of you after these. Okay, Judy, you have the last word. Um, and I want you to paint a picture for us. Okay. What would you want to see? What's the ideal situation? What's the transformation it impact, transformational impact it would have on the ground if indeed we gave access mm -hmm. to the next billion? Um. Well, okay, I'll begin it from there as I think it through. Okay, we, we're actually at the end. <laughs> but it, would it be transformational? You talked about your challenges in 30 seconds. How yes. would it transform the life of somebody who's struggling to access, can't use the technologies that exist? How would it transform their lives? Just in 30 seconds. Okay, I think um, what I'd like to leave here uh, and, and let everybody know is that we need uh, accessibility champions from whatever positions that we are in. Uh, we need to realize that there's a billion people that are being left out that needs to be included here. Yeah. Okay, so we, we, we end with that. Yes. But finally, actually, we, we are giving our Twitter feed a chance to wrap up the session. Just Julie, there minute. are so Thank many you. questions we must leave, uh, uh, actually, aside. But uh, although the physical panel ends here, the, the hashtag will always be open. So right. uh, for such an important topic, please, let's get in touch with our hashtag SIF14A to keep on discussing. To keep the conversation yeah, going. Yeah, and there are so many other questions that our participants and the, and the audience can consult and, and see, and, and I think we should, we should keep on discussing this very vital issue. Thank you so much for thank being you. part of this. I want to thank all of you for spending time with us and engaging. Let's give a big hand to our panel, please, for taking the time. It's been an absolute pleasure, thank you.